Good morning, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and we are so glad that you are here with us this morning for our briefing topic, Losing Ground, Managing Climate Risk in the Southeast. As we have looked at the unfolding of and the um, outreach going on around the release of the National Climate Assessment over the course of the last few weeks, it, we have been struck by the impacts, the need to look at risk management strategies across the country uh, because indeed every area of our country is affected by this. And of course we are seeing this in very real time as I think every state across the country, so many communities have been experiencing uh, all kinds of different uh, events, extreme weather events, and are having to deal with that. So we're dealing with very, very real problems that really need practical solutions and need to really think about how we make our infrastructure, our built infrastructure, our communities more resilient, how we really try and reduce to prevent as much risk as possible to the changes that we are seeing going on around us in which scientists have indicated those changes are, are undoubtedly going to become ever more frequent and, and indeed worse and therefore it's really important for us to understand the impacts and the implications of that so that we can begin to address them in thoughtful, um, effective and problem solving ways. So we are really excited about the presenters that we have with us here this morning uh, to take a look at this special region of our country, in particular the southeast. And to start us off this morning is Dr. Virginia Burkett, who is the Chief Scientist for Global Change with the U.S. Geological Survey. Dr. Burkett has been uh, working in this area for a long time. She's been involved with a number of the national assessments that have been done uh, over the last um, couple decades. She has also been involved as a lead author uh, as well with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment Reports. So she brings a wealth of experience and prior to joining USG, the forest ecology branch, uh, of, the, of the National Wetlands Research Center in Lafayette, Louisiana as part of USGS. Um, and she also had worked for the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service in Louisiana and had also uh, been heavily involved in coastal zone management in Louisiana. So Dr. Burkett, welcome. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for inviting me to the briefing series and for being able to to work with these folks here to kind of give context for the changes that we expect in the southeast. I know your presence here indicates your interest in the region. And for the, uh, the U.S. climate assessment, uh, for all three assessment reports now, and this is our third one, we've broken the country down into regions. And the southeastern region, you can see there on the bottom uh, lower right. And to, to support the chapters, of the National Climate Assessment, we did a series of reports like this one here. We started these three years ago. We did a coastal assessment that, that I helped lead. It had 80 co-authors on that. So literally hundreds and hundreds of scientists from around the country contributed to the inputs to the National Climate Assessment. Then we produced the highlights, which is the only uh, hard print thing we're doing. And, um, and you, outside we had just the little spread for the southeast. I want to acknowledge my, my lead authors, uh, Lynn Carter, who's in Africa now, and Jim Jones with the University of Florida, and the rest of us here. But basically, this is just to write, you know, the eight pages or so that send the, the full report that builds on all of this other work or draws from all of this other work that people have done in the region. The three key messages from the southeastern ch uh, report and from the chapter are pretty simple. Sea level rise, increasing temperatures, and decreasing water availability are the main threats to the environments and the regional economy of the Gulf Coast, to public health, forestry, agriculture, and uh, if you, ever, you might remember the water wars in Lake Lanier just a few years ago that really showed that the southeast is you know, not like the southwest in terms of being water scarce, but has a lot of challenges with water resources. 
Let's start with temperature, which is driving all of these changes. And you can see that the temperature for the southeast, can you see, I'm not going either way. The temperature for the southeast, it, it, it's unusual in that we had a cooling period here, but otherwise the trajectory has pretty much been like the rest of the, of the, the country and the United uh, and the world. And these are the emissions that, I mean, the, uh, the projections for the future under a high emission scenario and a low emission scenario. And these are comparable to what we found in IPCC as well. So all the things I'm going to present to you, I can't think of a single contradiction with the IPCC report that we just released last month. And a lot of folks, a guy from a magazine, a well-known magazine, called me and said, what about this cooling in the southeast? And trying to get their hands around this because this is on the cover of the report. And then tried to explain to him that this cooling period was so severe there in this, uh, this, this short term in the late 50s and 60s that if you do the average or the regression through all of the data, it looks like a cooling. But the southeast warmed, has warming now at rates comparable to the global average. So this is from the U.S. National Assessment. But if you look at this one from the uh, IPCC report, the most recent one, you can see these are using some, some data from the United States, from NOAA, that if you look from 1911 to 1940, you've got warming in the southeast. Everything that's, that's brown or, or yellow is warming. And then you've got this cool period. And the United States, like other parts of the northern hemisphere, some parts actually show cooling. But then, if you look at the last 20 years, 30 years, you see the southeast is cooling at rates that are comparable to the global average. So when you see that, that, that picture of the United States and it looks like the southeast is cooling, just remember that's because you've got a 110-year average shown there and it's just the most recent decades that, uh, I mean, it's because of the, you know, averaging out for that cool period right there. So it, it's, uh, it's in the data and it's, it's easily explained, but the picture does kind of throw people. There's the southeast. So looking at the southeast, uh, the days over 95 degrees projected in the future, you know, you can see here the change in the number of days over 95. Look at South Florida, North Louisiana, 30, 40, 50 days more of over 95 degree temperatures. And the same thing with the winter, the evening temperatures as well. And uh, ground level ozone increases with temperature, presenting a human health problem. And this is just a map from the National Assessment showing what we project by 2050 compared to 2001, the ground level ozone. Precipitation change, again, we've got some areas that look like they're getting drier, some areas are getting wetter. In general, in the northern hemisphere, the, the land areas are getting wetter. So if you look across the United States, particularly if you bring in Alaska, the trend is, and this is the U.S. average, a trend towards more rainfall, okay? But again, it's not the 100-year average, and it's not even the annual average that drives changes in ecosystems it's, it, or affects some communities. The changes in heavy precipitation, this is the actual trend. So we've got more rainfall, but it's coming down in the form of more heavy downpours, which are less effective in maintaining soil moisture, salinity in estuaries, and that sort of thing. This is the projected change in seasonal precipitation. And look for the growing season, particularly spring and summer. Much more dry conditions are projected. And that's just if you look at the, temp the precip precipitation aspect. And then you put temperature on top of that, and you've got higher rates of evapotranspiration, more intense and widespread droughts, more widespread and frequent fires, and so forth. More outbreaks of pests, like the southern pine beetle. Uh, just, it just cascades through the whole system. So remember that it's the combination of these drivers that will affect ecosystems and communities in the region. There we go. Okay. And uh, so as I mentioned, it's the combination of the increase in temperature with the changes in precipitation patterns that are projected to increase uh, the, the stress on uh, water supply in the southeast. Uh, this is the projected trend through the middle of the century due to climate change using a combination of a, 
of a, these are two conservative uh, emission scenarios. We're tracking above these two emission scenarios presently. And this is the spatial change in water availability. And where you have the hatched marks, that's where we have high model agreement. So we have higher confidence in the decline in water availability here than we do here, for example. In some areas, we expect to have more water. Mainly along that Atlantic coastline. And shifting now to changes in sea level rise, the rate of sea level rise, uh, based on the, the geologic uh, proxy data that we have for our coastal systems around the world, this is basically the trend. And then we have tide gauge data starting about 1880, going uh, through the current time and then about 1993 we have satellite altimetry data was became available and that's where you measure the absolute elevation of the ocean surface through time at thousands of stations or, or points around the globe very high confidence in, in this data here so the trend here uh, very similar to the global average uh, off the coast of the United States uh, but we do have some anomalies I'll show you and these are the projections in the National Climate Assessment if you look at the literature, the literature, because of the rate of ice sheet decline, there's a lot of uncertainty. The high end of the literature is here, two meters. And even in the IPCC report that just came out, the assessment says that, you know, we're, we're projecting up to one meter, but the semi-empirical model range is roughly twice that amount, two meters, but they have low confidence in those projections. So, for the United States Climate Assessment, we selected this range here of, for basically scenario planning. But if you're building a power plant, you might want to consider, you know, these higher ranges. If you're just revegetating a barrier island, you know, it, it really doesn't matter which range you pick. But we're encouraging people never to pick one number. You're most likely to pick the wrong number. Consider a range because the science on the rate of sea level rise is advancing, but we can't give you a single number. We'll give you a range, and that's what we suggest that people use for planning, including for coastal zone management, for example. And you'll hear some more from the Defense and the Department of Transportation uh, how they use them. And, um, you know, it's the global rate is one thing. That's why I just showed you. But this is the absolute rate of change in mean sea level along the United States coast from our last global change national climate assessment, NCA2, and you can see that the rate of change or the rate of sea level rise is higher off the Texas, Alabama, Louisiana coast, parts of the Atlantic coastal zone, and in Alaska, where those big red arrows are, and that's because the land is sinking, so the tide gauge is showing a higher rate of mean sea level rise, but it's all relative to the, to the change in the elevation of the land surface. So in South Texas and in New Orleans, we got this much sea level rise a year. Okay, but that's not just the global average, that's the local change in land elevation factored into that. Is that bothering y'all in the ears? Can we turn it down some, maybe? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good. Okay. All right. Uh, this is the vulner, you know, translating this into vulnerability for the for the southeast, and this is from the chapter here. You can see parts of the uh, uh, the coastal zone are much more vulnerable, uh, depending upon the, those local uh, land use land elevation changes primarily, and the substrate. This is in South Louisiana here, and. Uh, up in the very top where you can see the land kind of melting off into the Gulf of Mexico. That is the Gulf of Mexico. And when I started working for LSU Sea Grant in 1975, this was all solid marsh. And this is what it looks like today as a result of the combination of the sinking of the land surface and rising sea level and other processes that have to do with the way the river is managed. This uh, cemetery here was not built in open water, obviously, but that's what it looks like if you go through the, the coast, you know, you see all these relics from when the land was there and is no longer. Uh, in South Louisiana and other parts of the southeast, we have coastal uh, native tribes. Uh, this one here is uh, 
You can see in 1963 what the, you know, to see that solid wetland mass with that, uh, we call it an island today, but it used to not be an island. That is the homeland for the, uh, the, the Biloxi, or the Chinamacha tribes of the Homa Indians, and they're having to move because um, of the rate of land loss. Um, here is the road on the lower left there. It used to flood maybe every 20 years, and now it floods every year. So the, basically the, the, the tribe is scattering because they, they can't safely live there. They can't farm there anymore. That's after Hurricane Katrina on the right. And in the top, see those dead trees? That's saltwater intrusion killing the forest. So their, their whole landscape is just falling apart around them. Here's a, just some clips uh, where they're appealing to the, the parish council to help them relocate the islanders. And remember, it wasn't an island. It was part of a, of a connected coastal system just 30 or 40 years ago. Talking about the road. Another vulnerable area, South Florida, highly vulnerable to sea level rise. And in some of our, our work that we've done in the area... Uh, we see that the mangroves, which are more salt tolerant, you can see on the right there, the little squares, that's the amount of mangroves in South Florida. And as sea level is rising, the blue line, that's the tide gauge record, look at the higher and higher uh, quantities of mangroves. So the key findings, the final thing regarding hurricanes, it's not one of the three major things we've mentioned, but it is a huge driver in the southeast. In the past, one, these are the two main conclusions I think are relevant to the southeast. We uh, have observed a substantial increase in the intensity, frequency, and duration of storms, tropical cyclones, particularly in the strongest categories four and five since the early 1980s when we started having satellite data available, so we're confident in these statements. The increases are linked in part to higher sea surface temperatures, and by late century, an increase in the number of the strongest hurricanes is expected with more rainfall associated with those hurricanes. Low-lying Gulf and Atlantic coastal ecosystems will, systems will erode more rapidly if this continues. If any of you all are from Alabama, this is uh, Dolphin Island, pre-Hurricane Ivan. Ivan. This is post-Hurricane Ivan, and this is using some of our LIDAR imagery. All those little red dots, those are houses. That's the road running east to west. And uh, this is post-Katrina, what was left, and this is what it looks like on the ground. So this is the consequence of rising sea level combined with an intense storm. As a result of these sort of processes in the southeast, we've got the, the most frequent, the most costly climate disasters, weather-related disasters in the United States. But people are now understanding the facts and using that in planning. This is in, in South Florida where they're actually starting to factor climate change into their uh, adaptation strategies. Some states and some coastal communities have climate adaptation plans because of their knowledge of the science. So with that. Great. Thanks, Virginia. Um, and as, as we generally do at EESI briefings, we will hold questions until the end when we open it up for discussion with, um, with our speakers and the audience. So we are very, very um, uh, honored to have with us today two representatives of the U.S. Navy. And this is, is very, very important because as we look at the southeast, the U.S. Navy has immense amounts of installations, investments that are very important to the Navy, very important to the United States um, in the southeast. And, of course, the Navy has bases around the world and is looking at the implications of climate, the changes that we are already seeing, those things that are uh, uh, forecast for the future in terms of thinking about a long-term planning and what needs to be done now in terms of responding to changes already very well underway. So we will hear from two people, as I mentioned, from Roger Natsuhara, who is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy Installations and Environment with the Department of Navy. And prior to his work in this particular role, 
uh, where he oversees department-wide policies, all the procedures, uh, strategic plans for installation safety, energy, and environment. Prior to that, he also had worked for NOAA, where he was responsible for the management and policies. Well, I'm glad that we have all sorts of communication going on because that's really important as we think about what we need to do in terms of learning about climate. Um, it, where he was responsible for the management and policies of all real property facilities and logistics programs. Our other speaker from the Department of Navy is Rear Admiral Select Tim Gallaudet, who is Deputy Oceanographer of the Navy. And he brings a terrific background in oceanography, uh, graduating from the Naval Academy and then going on to get his PhD in oceanography from Scripps Institution. And he had previously served at the, um, as the superintendent of the U.S. Naval Observatory and then joined the Chief of Naval Operations Staff in 2009, where he is, uh, among other things, the Deputy Director of the Navy's Task Force on Climate Change. Is there a... It's not working. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, and thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it, and I apologize for being a little bit late uh, today. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, for the Department of Navy, uh, we have bases uh, all over the world, but about 70% of our bases, you would expect, are along the coastlines. Uh, so uh, sea level rise, climate change is a real uh, concern of ours, uh, not only from the operational, what we have to do from an operational side of protecting this country, but our, our installations along the, the shore. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of our other bases that uh, that are along that are not along the shore, but we also are experiencing the effects of climate change, and I and I think you're going to uh, hopefully see that this is a serious issue for us. Uh, but the, the message I think I'm, I really want to present to you is that we are part of the community. We cannot solve this independently and just look at the Navy bases because we are so dependent upon the, the community at large that uh, a solution for us doesn't work independently. It has to be a, with the community a, a really uh, coordinated um, decision on how, how we go forward on these things. Uh, and these are just some of the uh, executive orders and uh, the QDR is the Quadrennial Defense Review. Every four years, uh, DOD, we take a look at all our mission uh, that we need to look at. And climate change has been uh, discussed in the last two uh, QDRs for us. And uh, the DOD Climate Change Adapt Adaptation Roadmap is uh, another internal policy that we've been working on. Uh, next slide, please. So, so what, we're, what are we doing in the Department of Navy? Uh, the different levels, the Senior Sustainable Council were part of that with the administration. Uh, DOD has their own climate uh, Adaptation Workshop in, in the Navy, uh, the uh, Navy Task Force Climate Change, and uh, Admiral Gallaudet will speak more about that, I'm sure. Uh, next slide, please. So, so what do we expect, uh, as we all expect? Sea level rise and storm surges. Uh, increasing the frequency, the changing uh, precipitation patterns, global changes, uh, and the as a recent event in Pensacola, uh, our Whiting Field, we experienced a 500-year flood there. Uh, we, the amount of rain was uh, cause of damage below. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why you know, I mentioned about the, uh, the, how we need to work with the communities. Uh, and we really kind of look at it, I kind of look at it, and I think we're, I'm trying to get the department uh, to look at it in really kind of two discrete uh, buckets, I'll say. The, the long-term uh, sea level rise, uh, that's really a long-term, and, and what are we going to do about that? Uh, we really can't put in our own uh, design criteria of protecting the basis because everything we, we use, and I tell folks, all our, the, the bases don't work without our civilian workforce. Most of our married... Uh, sailors and Marines live off base, all our contractors live off base, but we're dependent on the infrastructure of the cities and communities around us, water, sewage normally, uh, electricity, but the road system. 
So if those aren't functioning, our bases can't function. Uh, so if an area is gonna be flooded out uh, in the long term, we're probably gonna have to leave just like the rest of the community. So spending a lot of money and planning to protect the base for sea level rise, if the community can't protect the community, it really doesn't make sense uh, to do that. And I think those are the discussions we're having within the department of, you know, people have asked us, are you spending money? What are your design criteria? Uh, my answer keeps coming back is we really have to work with the whole interagency and the communities on that because uh, there are certain things that we can do. Uh, so on the, the second side, the storm surge is really the discrete uh, weather events. There are certain things that we can do uh, and we are doing uh, to plan for those. But it's not as extensive, I, I think, what some people would think we should be doing. Uh, we'll do, we're, we're in discussions like things like our mechanical equipment, our data centers and those kind of things. Do we put those, instead of having them on the bottom floors that like we typically do, of raising those up, maybe put them on the second and third floors. So when you do get these uh, events of flooding, storm surges, at least your mechanical equipment, your, your IT centers aren't gonna be damaged, uh, and it'll be easier to reconstitute. Uh, but as far as uh, planning for weather, discrete weather events, uh, we're, we're not immune to the same damages outside of the, the community. Uh, we've seen that in, in the, some of the good examples, uh, you know, the, the, the big example in Japan, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. You know, they have, the, in all our nuclear power plants in this country too, they have backups, but when they're right next to it, and you have such a catastrophic event like that, you're gonna lose all your backups too. And so for us to spend the monies uh, to put those backups in, it, it may not make sense. We do have emergency uh, backup generators on all our critical loads, but even those in an event like that, we would lose those. Uh, but in reality, when, what have you seen in uh, Katrina, Sandy, uh, is we're part of the community. And so we're not gonna operate the bases normally uh, in our normal operations during the recovery phase. The, the getting ready for a storm, during the storm, uh, we tend, we sortie the fleet. The, the fleet, our aircraft, we disperse those. So if we know a storm's coming, we leave the area. We encourage our families to leave the area, uh, just like everybody else. So the, the base is going to be at, at a minimal manning. So for us to spend a lot of money uh, to, to plan to have the bases running normally, normal operation. Uh, probably doesn't make sense. Uh, we don't have that. Those are the discussions we're having because it's very expensive to do that. Um, and then during the recovery, we're with the community. We're normally open the bases up to, to have FEMA to be able to stage things, other agencies to stage their equipment. We'll bring in emergency generators uh, from other areas. And in my personal opinion, I think that's the right thing to do because uh, we have all these assets uh, dispersed and it's probably better because we can get them in fairly quickly uh, instead of having each base stage because we're probably gonna lose it in a disaster, uh, in a weather event disaster. Uh, so those are some of the policy discussions we're having internally of what should we do? How much money should we spend uh, on, on our bases? Uh, but we're also seeing, uh, a, getting away from the, the shoreline, we're seeing, uh, the effects of climate change on our, on our other bases. An example, uh, just recently in the last weeks uh, in the Southwest, because of the, the droughts they're having in California and the severe uh, uh, water shortage out there, the, the change in climate, the change, uh, Camp Pendleton has, uh, it's, it's annually now that they, they we're spending lots of money and time fighting fires back uh, because of the dry conditions out there. It's starting to affect the amount of training we can have because if you've seen the news, a lot of the uh, assets, the Marines have been providing helicopters, which is the right thing to do to help 
fight the fires in the community, which is also because it's pushing up right up against the base too. Uh, so we've had fires on Camp Pendleton, like I said, almost every year now for the last few years because of the dry conditions. Our master jet base in the central California Lemoore, uh, because of the drought there is, we're surrounded by uh, agriculture, which is a great place to be for uh, a jet base because of all the noise. But because of the, the, the droughts, the farmers aren't able to get the water to, to, to grow crops. When that happens, uh, we get the, the fields become infested with uh, little critters. The little critters attract birds. Birds and jet airplanes don't go well, so it affects our uh, training. Uh, so there's a lot more birds out there because we're not, the farmers aren't able to grow. Uh, so all these things combined are, are, are a big issue for us. Uh, so it's just not the sea level rises. These climate changes are really affecting us, uh, our ability to train and do what we need to do uh, throughout the United States. So, uh, you know, not just the coastal areas concern us, our drier climates. We have big bases uh, and training areas in, in the desert areas, but with Water is becoming a real issue out there. I know the Army has one of their bases that are, is in really critical need. Uh, all these things affect uh, your, your military. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what are we doing? Uh, we're actually, we, we started an assessment, a three-tier assessment of all our bases back in uh, 2013. We expect to have that done in 2015. Uh, it's... Uh, it's a two-year process that we're going through to try to look at all the vulnerabilities and discuss what do we need to do uh, on these things. And, uh, and like I talked about, we're really trying to push this whole community approach that w we cannot solve these things in isolation to ourselves because, like I said, our bases aren't going to work without the community working. Uh, roads, railroads, Without that, we, we cannot operate. And so, uh, as you saw in some of the earlier pictures, uh, if we become an island, the base is really not functional. We, we just couldn't function like that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so where we're at, where are we moving to? We're really at, at the early stages. Uh, we're starting to get into some much more deep discussions on this, because on the surface, uh, it seems like every conference I've gone to, I've been asked, how come the Navy isn't doing this? How come they... Well, because we're really part of the community. We need to work with the communities uh, to make sure their planning is aligned. Because if it's not, like I said, we just aren't going to be able to operate. Uh, and so we're just trying to integrate uh, our climate change into everything we look at. We're looking at our... Uh, our design criteria for our buildings, uh, different locations, and trying to make adjustments as we can. Uh, and as I mentioned, from our perspective, you know, we need a common government-wide set of criteria, and, and that's what we really want to push to. Uh, I think that's it. Right? Next slide. And so I will turn it over to uh, the Admiral. Thank you, sir. The real name for Admiral Select is Captain, <laughs> but thank you, sir. Um, my name is uh, Tim Gallaudet. I am the Deputy Oceanographer for the Navy, and I'm representing Admiral John White. He's the Oceanographer of the Navy, works for Chief of Naval Operations, and he also has another role as the Director of this task force, Navy's Task Force on Climate Change. Um, quick perspective is I uh, helped establish that task force in, in 2009, and uh, it was interesting. Next slide, please. Um, at the time when we went out into the Russell Building, for example, there was a lot of uh, a lot of what we had to do was defend the science. And I'm pleased to say that we're really just we're not talking about things anymore. We're actually doing things. Um, so it's, it's nice to have that perspective. I'm, not, I'm going to brief to you what the Navy is actually doing. And Mr. Natsuhara had given you a, a piece of that. Um, I'll, I'll elaborate just a bit. Um, but. Uh, in, in hindsight, or you know, looking back then, we, the, the climate change skeptics uh, were, were kind of had a pretty pitched battle, and we, we had to we had to really um, convince a lot of people that, that based on sound science, that the, the Navy had reasons to care about climate change and to act. Um, and it's nice to see now that most 
You know, they're, they're still there, especially um, in, in the Congress. There are those who doubt the science and doubt the even fact of climate change existing. But um, I think we move beyond that, and it's nice to see. Um, Anybody see the Colbert Report? Do you guys watch that? I bet you're the type, kind of audience that probably sees that show. So you might have seen Tom Friedman on it recently about his show, Years of Living Dangerously. And uh, he's talking about climate change, too. And that guy's got a pretty powerful intellect. So you, you, if, he's think, if he's considering it, you know that the Navy's in the right direction by considering it. So next slide, please. So quick background. This, this Task Force on Climate Change established in 2009 Currently, we report to this gentleman uh, in the whites there, Admiral John, or Admiral John Greener, the Chief of Naval Operations, and, and we are his uh, point of contact or, or point per person for uh, all things related to climate. The biggest concern in 2009 was the opening of the Arctic. It's, it's another ocean, so the Navy obviously cared, and we wanted to address that first and foremost. And we established a roadmap for the Arctic in, in 2010 to guide Navy's uh, actions, investments, um, and um, uh, in efforts to be ready to operate in the Arctic as the ice retreats. We updated that roadmap just recently in 2014, and we also had a, 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 have a climate change roadmap we're actioning, and it's aligned with the current DOD climate change adaptation roadmap. So this task force consists of a number of, of people on the Navy staff. We partner with the Coast Guard, the Office of Naval Research, and NOAA, and we engage with the interagency community, the government, and uh, academia, and um, scientific institutions to inform us and ensure that all our, all our efforts are based on sound science. Um, uh, Dr. Burkett, I applaud you, your contribution to the uh, National Climate Assessment. Um, personal story here, you guys have a little chart in there that talks about the Katrina diaspora. Do you recall that? Have you guys seen that, that little graphic? So I'm one of those. The little part in San Diego is probably my, my family, I want at least one of the, part of that dot, because uh, I was on the Gulf Coast when uh, Katrina hit, and so our house was totally leveled. And a uh, 35-foot storm surge is something serious to consider. And, um, but at any rate, uh, so I, underst I understand uh, you know, installation vulnerability quite well from a personal perspective. Um, so, but sound science, like the National Climate Assessment, is guiding what we do. Next slide, please. So in, in a big picture sense, and I know we're focused on the southeast and, and in, in this venue, but, but this, is, this is why the Navy cares in a big picture sense. Of course, we use Neptune's trident here as the appropriate icon. We're in the Navy. You know, go figure. And, uh, and we're talking about the lower prong today, the infrastructure in the southeast. But as I mentioned, the Arctic is, is a, one of our most important considerations. It's an operating area that we want to ensure remains safe and stable, stable and secure. And there's much kind of hype in the press about potential militarization of the opening of the Arctic. And, and that's just not our approach. We're, we have very strong collaborative relationships, even with the Russians, at least in the Arctic, not in the Black Sea maybe, but in the Arctic. And, um, and so we are using this opening area, we view it as an opportunity to increase our, our partnering with other nations. Uh, and then there's a global security aspect of climate change impacts that we have to consider. I, I, I recommend you all look online for a, a recent report by an outfit called the Center of Naval Analyses, CNA. The, the report is produced by a group called their Military Advisory Board, a number of uh, four-star four, four admirals and generals and, and others who uh, are assess the, the national security implications of climate change. And the recent report uh, found that, the, the, that from their, the, their previous report of 2007, uh, they under forecast the, the rate of security risks. And the impacts physically were happening faster than they thought, and, and the security risks were growing. For example, they, they provide several uh, vignettes, like Syria was linked very, the, the civil war in Syria was linked very tightly to the years of drought that has been experienced in the rural areas, and that, and that forced a mass migration of people into the urban areas, and they were disaffected and had no work, and now you have that mess that's occurring there now. So climate related, and the report concluded that we'll probably see more of those. And that's the U.S. Navy from a national security standpoint cares about that. <clears throat> and so th that's the big picture why. Next slide. Uh, sea level rise is an important element of this. And as Mr. Natsuhara mentioned, we, we, have, we have challenges that we, we must address in a whole community approach to ensure our, our infrastructure remains resilient. But at the same time, you know, we can't build to the 500-year storm, so we also have to build a capability to respond. Um, so with respect to these challenges, there, there are also opportunities, and I, I have to 
I'd like to move the discussion of all the gloom and doom with respect to climate change away to the how can we, you know, how can we do something positive with it? And there is, there are things. Partnering with allied, our allied nations or, or emerging partners and helping them build a response capability is, is a great opportunity for us. For example, the recent relief efforts of, uh, associated with Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. The Navy was the first on the scene with our Marine Corps brothers and sisters. And that was an opportunity to help show the Filipinos and build, build their response capacity. And this will be a long-term effort, but uh, we can do that throughout the world. And there are a number of emerging uh, nations that, we, that, are, that are developing and that we, if we forge close ties with and help them respond, uh, we, can, we can make them more resilient in, in kind. Next slide. So uh, the, the, uh, we support the Department of Defense being a part of the department. And three of the main efforts that, that we're contributing to the Navy uh, are, are assessing vulnerability. And the three -tier, this is the three-tiered approach that Mr. Natsuhara approached. Uh, we've developed a very detailed uh, uh, methodology with a number of uh, supporting organizations like the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, we in the Navy are also focused on the prediction aspect. Uh, Dr. Burkett had mentioned that with sea level rise that there's a kind of a wide range of uncertainty. And we have the capability as a nation to drive down that uncertainty and, and, and so that we can make better planning and, and resourcing decisions. You have, uh, I'll, I'll talk to it in an, uh, an upcoming slide. And then the, the last piece is taking our vulnerability assessments and, and developing planning scenarios for the different ranges of, of potential climate impacts, like, like sea level rise, of rises of one, two, and more meters, that kind of thing. So we, 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 the scenarios are, are, what we're developing are, are intended to kind of give us the range of options that we can consider and do the cost-benefit analysis. So I'll talk briefly on these, and I think and I'll be able to get it done in time here. Next slide. So for our facility vulnerability assessments, we have a pilot project for the Hampton Roads area circled in the red there, and our intent is to basically export the, the processes and approach of, of that assessment to all of our facilities in the, in the ensuing years to come. And so uh, this, this pilot is going to be a model that we hope to use and apply uh, across the CONUS and then even outside of the continental U.S. Next slide. Uh, the Hampton Roads area, as Mr. Natsuhara mentioned, is a very vulnerable area, and that's the focus of this pilot. We're, we're partnering with the Old Dominion University there. And again, we're, we're bringing in, uh, uh, we're forming a group, uh, kind of in a construct that, like a joint interagency task force of local, city, um, and industry types to help inform and contribute. Uh, next slide. Because in, in this eye chart here, sorry, a little complicated, this shows the extent of interdependencies with different sectors just to so address the multiple problems, for example, that a, a carrier peer may have to uh, face with respect to rising sea levels and extreme events. So you, you probably can't see very well, but this, is, this just sort of maps out if I want to provide steam to that peer. Uh, the different things that cross over, not only across the base to outside the base, that I, I must address the climate change impacts on to ensure that's resilient. So um, bottom line is that there are many people that will contribute, many sectors that will contribute to this, and that's therefore this whole community approach. Next slide. Uh, this is the prediction piece I mentioned, and all those logos are people who spend tens of billions of dollars on climate prediction except for the Navy, because we don't have that kind of budget for it. But there is a national capability that exists, but it is fractured. And it is our effort, through this, something called the Earth System Prediction Capability, to unify climate and weather prediction so it's operational and can provide decision makers the right information that drive down, drives down uncertainty. Next slide. So finally, just to conclude, the Navy is acting. That's my message here. We are doing things. We are assessing the scope of problems, and we are changing our policies and plans. Secretary, or, uh, pardon me, Admiral Greenard is behind this. Uh, Secretary of Defense Hagel also ha is behind this through the DOD Climate Change um, Adaptation Plan. And, of course, the administration, with the documents that Mr. Natsuharo had briefed on the first slide, is, is driving it all from the top. Um, we need the support of this other group of people in that funny shaped building. And ultimately, that will derive from the political will of the people, which are increasingly less likely to want to shell out the money for these kinds of what they view as long-term, not really immediate efforts. And so that's a com campaign we all together have to uh, address and move out on. 
So I'm happy to take your questions after the end of the presentations. Thanks. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you are all storing up lots of questions and comments. And I think it's, it's also very important, very, um, I think, compelling for all of us to understand how what you're doing and in terms of the, the leadership and the planning, the thinking that you're doing is really important in terms of helping communities understand and figure out what does make sense for everybody because we literally are all in the same boat together. So we are now going to take a look at our transport sector and the vulnerabilities that, um, that are um, being examined, are being looked at uh, in the southeast. And to uh, talk to us about that a little bit this morning is Rob Kefalenos, who is the Environmental Protection Specialist uh, at the De um, uh, Department of Transportation's Federal Highway Administration. And, uh, and I know that Rob has been looking at all of this for a number of years with regard to leading some of these climate change efforts at the Department of Transportation, working across the department, uh, as well as with his colleagues at FHWA. And again, I think it brings up the whole situation that you were talking about um, with regard to thinking about all of this infrastructure that is critical in terms of supporting all of our communities and our and whether it's our Navy or our Army bases or whatever, but all of the infrastructure that is vital in terms of um, uh, basically supporting the community, the economy, everything to make it all work. So it's all got to be thought about together. Rob? Thank you. I think I need some more hands to hold, uh, hold different things. Um, that's okay. I'm good. Thanks. Um, so I've been at Federal Highways for about 12 years. We've been focusing on climate change adaptation since I think just before Hurricane Katrina. Um, this morning I'm going to talk about a few things. Uh, talk about Federal Highway and DOT goals as it re relates to climate change adaptation. I'm going to talk about a a framework that we have for analyzing vulnerabilities and some pilot studies of it. And then the last half of the presentation, I'll focus on talking about the Gulf Coast 2 study, which is in Mobile, and some resulting uh, tools that we have coming out of it. So um, at Federal Highways, we have a pretty clear goal when it comes to climate change. We want to see concerns tied to climate change adaptation kind of mainstreamed into our different processes. And we kind of look at, we kind of break up the work in both at both the system level and also the project level. So at the system level, we're talking about long-range planning at the metropolitan area by metropolitan planning organizations and state DOTs, and as well as asset management. At the project level, we're focused more on um, all the different processes that have to go into to create and build a piece of transportation infrastructure. So that can include the environmental process, preliminary engineering, design, construction, operations, and maintenance. Um, and the reasons that we care about this, the reason we focus on this, there's really two key reasons. Uh, one is that uh, we're concerned about safety. Transportation safety is a key goal of federal highways that's been a mainstay of the, of the department too for forever. Um, and then there's also these large scale financial investments across the country at the federal, state, and local level that need to be protected uh, from future impacts of climate change. So we have, for both of these efforts, both the larger scale systems level goal, we have a series of activities designed to support those, and then a key products that are coming out of that. The key product at the systems level is this, this climate change and extreme weather vulnerability assessment framework, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, the Gulf Coast 2 study, the pilot studies of this framework, and then some other studies we have going on are supporting um, developing and filling out what's in, in that framework. And then at the project level, we have, it's a little bit more, little, quite a few different moving pieces going on. But there, our goal is to really update different uh, engineering manuals and methods and procedures for engineers, for designers, and environmental people to use when they're designing projects. And again, we have a series of projects that, that go along to support these. Some of the same ones I already mentioned. Then also, we're starting up um, just now a large project to look at about 10 or about 15 to 20 assets across the country. So that could be roads, bridges, and other things that are uh, highway specific to understand how they're vulnerable and develop adaptation options at the engineering level uh, to support those structures. 
Um, we also have um, a, a manual that's designed for coastal engineers to use when designing bridges and highways in coastal environments, where right now um, our engineering side is in the process of updating that to add in uh, information tied to future extreme weather, future climate change, so including sea level rise and changes in, in hurricanes and coastal storms. And then we have a series of hydrology and hydraulic engineering research efforts uh, that are also underway. So this is the, the framework that I was referring to. This is actually the second iteration of the framework. Um, each iteration has a slightly different name, but you can probably find the word climate and the word framework in it. Um, it's basically divided into three different pieces. The first is, and this is not rocket science, it's pretty logical. The first piece is divine, defining project scope. And that, so that means somebody who's using the framework, whether it's a, a local organization or a state, would decide what their objectives are. They would decide what the relevant assets are that they want to focus on. Do they want to focus on highways or do they want to focus on transit or both? And consider the kinds of climate variables that are most relevant. And then in the second phase, they would find the climate information and get, gather together all the information on the structures that they're looking at and use that information to uh, assess the vulnerabilities. And then the third stage is actually in some ways the most important, which is why we put it in the very small print that you can't read. Um, but that's taking that information and pulling it into your various planning process, processes, whether it's long-range planning, short-term short um, tips, the transportation improvement programs, or asset management or engineering. So we've used this now in a series of pilot studies. So the first series of pilot studies we had ran until 2011. And it focused, we, we, we created the framework and provided some seed funding um, for five areas. Uh, MTC in San Francisco, the Oahu MPO, the, the Washington State DOT, New Jersey State DOT, and Hampton Roads of Virginia. They piloted the framework. We got information from that and updated it. And now we have 19 pilot studies going on as well across the country. And that's what most of these green places are on the map. Um, in the second phase, we've, we've made a, an extra effort to, to reach out to non-coastal areas in, as well. So we're doing some interesting things with precipitation um, in New York State and Michigan and Iowa and Minnesota that are sort of new and somewhat cutting edge, I'd say. Um, and then we also have the Sandy Project in the Northeast um, and then the New Mexico Scenario Planning in New Mexico and then lastly, uh, the Gulf Coast 2 study. And the Gulf Coast 2 is, is focused on Mobile. So I'm going to talk for the remainder of the talk about Gulf Coast and Gulf Coast 2. Um, the Gulf Coast study is divided into two phases. The first phase focused on climate vulnerabilities across the Gulf Coast region from Houston, Galveston to Mobile, Alabama. Um, it's a multimodal, and both of these are multimodal studies. I, I work with federal highways, but we run the studies for the department. So it focuses on all the different transportation modes or most of the transportation modes within the, the department. Um, we've had a lot of cooperation on the project, especially the second project, which focuses on Mobile. We've been working very closely with the, the South Alabama Regional Planning Commission, the state DOT, and the county transportation folks. Um, we've also had a lot of cooperation with the USGS and, and Virginia's people uh, focusing on the science. Um, so the, this study is broken down into four tasks. The first two tasks are already complete. The first task was designed to, to isolate the most key transportation facilities to the operation of transportation in Mobile. The second focused on identifying the climate effects, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, next. And then the third study is the study is the part that we're almost done with right now, and that's focusing on identifying the vulnerabilities across the transportation system in Mobile, and then also doing these very specific engineering analyses on uh, 11 different assets there. And the last task is developing um, the transferable tools. So we're almost done with the study. We should be done this summer. Um, just very briefly, I'll talk about some of the climate effects information we put together. Um, we looked at basically, for temperature and precipitation, we looked at a series of three different scenarios, a low, a medium, and a high. We developed projections out across, out to the end of the century over three different time periods, 30, 30 years each beginning in 2010. Um, as we would expect, and as I think Virginia's information already supported, we, we found that there would be definitely a, a gradual ramp up across all the scenarios in terms of the number of, of hot days, which we define as days above 95 or 100 degrees and also more extreme higher high temperatures. In, when we looked at precipitation, we also find that there would be increases in precipitation, but that's the, some of the model results were more mixed, that there was a broad range of results across the models, and that's something we find with precipitation a lot more than with temperature. Uh, for transportation, we're very concerned with specific thresholds, so we did analyses to project what the 100-year, 24-hour event would be, and we found 
there too there would be increases, but there would be some broad range across models for that. So next I'm going to talk about sea level rise and storm surge. Um, we developed 11 different storm surge scenarios for Mobile. Um, we based the storm surge scenarios on two historic storms that were very important to the region and also to Mobile. So we started off with Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Georges. Um, Georges and Katrina were about equally bad for Mobile, but Katrina is the one that gets the headlines because it, it affected a much broader swath of the Gulf Coast region. We took those two storm tracks. Um, we adjusted the tracks to, to, to account for different possibilities for storms so that the storm surge track went just to the west of Mobile. Um, we added in information for some of the scenarios to increase the intensity of the winds tied to the way that climate change can affect, is thought to be able to, to affect um, coastal storms in the future. And then we added in, uh, for some of the scenarios, different ranges of sea level rise, because sea level rise can magnify uh, the, the storm surge that can happen, and it can also magnify the wave heights on, on, on top of the storm surge. So we created these 11 different scenarios and looked at vulnerabilities uh, to these different storm surges. So next I'm going to talk about the vulnerability assessment part of this. Vulnerability is defined um, by the IPCC, by others as well, as a function of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. Uh, we chose an indicators approach to figure out how to analyze what those different factors could be as it relates to transportation in our study region. Um, and then we averaged those indicators to develop a scoring process that, that I'll talk about in a second. So exposure is basically the climate information that we put together. Sensitivity is the extent to which a structure, a road, a highway can be affected by a given level of exposure. Um, and adaptive capacity is the ability of a system or an asset to adjust or to be repaired after the impact. So these are examples of some of the um, indicators that we used. Um, for sensitivity, the indicators vary by the type of asset you're looking at, whether it's a pipeline or a bridge or a rail link, and also it varies by the climate effect. So for temperature, when we looked at sensitivity, we considered things like the asphalt binder type. Certain asphalt binder types work better than others under high heat scenarios. We considered traffic, uh, truck traffic volumes. For precipitation, we considered the conditions of culverts. For surge, storm surge and sea level rise, we considered uh, whether or not there was the pres presence of, of sea walls, considered the heights of bridges and the heights of approaches to the bridges. And then for adaptive capacity, this was a little tougher to deal with, we considered things tied to the speed of recovery, the speed of repair, the cost of repairing something if it is destroyed um, in an extreme event. And then lastly for adaptive capacity, we looked at redundancy. And redundancy, that's a, more of a system process to see whether or not there's redundancy in the system to take up slack uh, if you lose a particular facility. So all the, all the um, indicators and all the vulnerability scores were calculated in a range of one to four, four being the highest. And so you can't see them because they're clouded out in red, but the ones at the top are the ones that were considered the most vulnerable under the different um, scenarios. And this is looking at two scenarios of the low end of storm surge and the high end of storm surge. Then this is just an example for storm surge vulnerability. Um, this is looking at the causeway um, across Mobile Bay. Uh, storm surge vulnerability is generally highest where, Mobile, where the Mobile River meets Mobile Bay. Um, also for low-lying coastal roads, any, any facilities that are closest uh, to the bay, those are the ones that are considered most, that came out through the analysis as being the most vulnerable. Um, I mentioned that we did a series of... Um, engineering assessments. Um, this is an example of one of them, but we did some for, for rails and for highways um, and some, and, and, uh, some long-scale uh, bridges as well. And we looked at those and applied uh, different kinds of climate drivers to those to see different kinds of climate stressors to see how vulnerable they were. And we ran through engineering processes to figure out the best ways to adapt those. So just I want to talk very briefly about a few implications, and then I'll talk about some tools that we're developing. Um, the kinds of infrastructure that we build and that state DOTs and locals build, um, they last for different periods of time. Local roads may last 20 years. Interstates may, may be designed to last for um, 50 years to 75 years. And uh, major bridges may be designed to last for um, 75 years to 100 years. So it's important to consider how long your structure is designed to last when you make decisions about when to go in or how you would go in to update it to make it more resilient to climate change. Um, we know that climate change will affect maintenance cycles and investment decisions on when and where to invest and when and where to go in and reconstruct a facility. 
this adds uncertainty to the whole transportation planning and designing process, but it's, it's, it's just another uncertainty. So our goal is to try to mainstream consideration of climate in these processes as another, as one issue among, among many that has to be dealt with. We know that we can expect higher maintenance and operations costs going forward and also potentially costlier structures as we try to design them to be more resilient. However, adaptation can really save funding over the longer term. I think the last speaker mentioned this point of trying to get people to think longer term about things as opposed to just the next funding cycle. Our goal is that people will think more about solutions that will last over the long term that can save funds and, it, and also consider the fact that um, it's, it, to us it's very important to focus on proactive stat strategies that can protect things um, before disasters happen and really avoid the disasters. So lastly, um, this is a list of the kinds of tools that we're developing out of Gulf Coast. We have a couple of, I'd say, five different tools that we are, we're really excited about. The first two are basically uh, spreadsheets or documents, matrices, to help people, um, when they're looking at their, the transportation infrastructure in their region, to gauge what is critical and what is not critical. So they can go in and decide what is the most critical infrastructure to whatever their functions are that they care about for their, for their state or for their city. Next is a sensitivity matrix. This is designed to match up different kinds of climate effects, temperature and precipitation, storm surge, along with different kinds of infrastructure to, to identify what thresholds matter for those different structures so they know what kinds of information they need to collect uh, when they're doing the climate work. And then, as I mentioned, we have a series of documented engineering studies going and looking at vulnerabilities and identifying ways to adapt them. And then last two, we have a CMIP climate data processing tool. This is a tool that basically summarizes work that we did in a year and a half in an afternoon in some respects. It basically goes in and downloads downscaled climate um, projections for temperature and precipitation, puts them in a spreadsheet and allows you to calculate specific variables, some of which we used in our study uh, for Mobile. And that's just for temperature and precipitation. And lastly is the vulnerability assessment scoring tool. Uh, the vulnerability assessment scoring tool is um, basically a large spreadsheet that, allow, that helps a user go through and do a linear kind of analysis of vulnerability um, to the further structures. Um, all these things will be posted on our website this summer. Um, and that's it. I think I'm out of time. So thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, and I want to thank all of our speakers for kind of laying out. And Virginia, do you want to come up here? Great. Uh, for, for laying out uh, this whole picture of what it is that we are both facing and also efforts that are underway to help us all think in a clear fashion about what the implications are and how we might best plan and and adapt and and mitigate some of these efforts so let's open it up for your um, questions or comments and if you could please identify yourself any questions comments <coughs> Hi, uh, Chris Trent, U.S. Geological Survey. And I wanted to ask uh, Captain Gallaudet if you could elaborate a little bit more about the, um, the unified prediction uh, activity that you had described, specifically some of the successes you've had, but also maybe the challenges that you have yet to overcome. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, I had to kind of fly through that slide because when somebody was holding up a three minutes card. Um, Yes, so the, the Navy is underway. We have committed uh, about, we have a plan to spend about $45 million over a five-year period to increase our uh, operational weather and climate prediction capability. We have a, a, an area that's focused on the Arctic and sea ice, coupled ocean, ice, and atmospheric uh, prediction capability. Uh, we, we, we are partnered with the U.S. Air Force and NASA and DOE and, and NOAA. Um, the, the degree that everybody is participating is, is um, somewhat limited currently. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll specifically mention that the Department of Energy and at, at some of their national laboratories, you know, they have very large uh, supercomputing capability and run very detailed climate, very, very capable climate prediction uh, systems. 
and, and we're working to bring them on board. So it's, the idea is that we'd like to have a capability that uh, with quantified uncertainty, but reduces uncertainty of current tools and improves our prediction out from zero hours to 30 years. Uh, and so we can look at interseasonal, you know, I think NOAA has recently released their forecast for the hurricane season. Uh, I, I believe we could do better if we take a whole of government approach, we being this, this group of people, NOAA included. And um, because I think mean, historically, you know, there, those, those forecasts are kind of hit and miss. The Navy would find great value in knowing, having a very, let's say, a less uncertain understanding of what, what the uh, hurricane and tropical cyclone um, forecast for the season would be, as just one example. Um, so the, this, is, this uh, effort continues to move forward. Whenever we go to the Hill, we like to talk about it. And uh, we hope to secure a little more support. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. OK. I have a question for FHA. Uh, what, I failed to, what I failed to see in your brief was, uh, with all the data that you have, do you uh, accommodate the local communities that might be in a catastrophic event uh, to describe uh, evacuation routes, for instance. Well, this is this is part partly answering. I mean, the what we do here is we're doing different studies to help support areas that want to do this kind of planning. So we work with local and metropolitan planning organizations. We work with them. We have tools that help them do these things. In the study that I was referring to, there is a whole process for identifying critical infrastructure, and as part of that is identifying evacuation routes and disaster recovery routes. So in that sense, we work with them and help, help them to put that information together and make decisions about uh, how to protect those kinds of facilities. So it is their responsibility, in, in essence. I mean, you're, you're providing them data, but... We provide them tools and information, yeah. So, you know, I, we're probably different from the Navy and different from other areas. We're a very um, decentralized organization. There's the, the larger DOT, there's the federal highway part that I work for. Um, and then we provide um, tools and information and funding to states and, and, and DO, to states and locals to help do these things. Other comments? Okay. I'm Terry Hill with the Passive House Institute. You know, there's, it's very exciting to hear all these um, uh, tools that are being developed. Uh, they have a huge impact on buildings, on future utility, grid designs, etc. How are these tools being get, going to be brought together so that we can get an overall view of this? You know, it, it seems to me to be Lots still pretty stovepipe, but the tools are, if they pan out, are pretty exciting and have wide application. You might all want to take. A... I, Go ahead, Bob. I, I'll start. I mean, I'm a, I think that under the 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 latest executive order from November November first, there's a whole effort underway to try to centralize that. It's not something I'm personally working on, but Virginia and the and the Navy may know more about. It. For the, the Navy, the, the DOD has what's called UFCs, Unified Facility Codes, and uh, that's uh, centralized with our DOD, uh, so all the services follow that. Uh, but, but that is somewhat limited uh, just to the DOD facilities. Um, there is an interagency uh, process that our, the D, our, my DOD counterpart sits on. Uh, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure how far they are. Like I said in my brief, I think we're still in our early stages of, of uh, really, and I kind of have joking with my folks, you know, as an engineer, you give me a problem, we'll solve it, but you got to give me the right problem to solve. And so I look to, to Tim and his organization, and the, we really need to know, what do you want us to design to? Uh, is it a, a one meter rise? where and over what period uh, because until we know what we're supposed to design to uh, I'm sure Federal Highway has the same issue that uh, we don't want to get too far ahead of anyone uh, 
So the scientists really have to kind of tell us what, it, what should we, and that's to me the whole, the interagency and the administration, everyone has to agree that this is going to be the criteria you, everyone needs to design to. FEMA will have to adjust their floodplain maps, and, and that's what we really designed to. Yes, um, in my last slide I had a picture of the guys in Florida holding up the map and doing planning and I thought I really ought to put something in there about the federal strategy because this administration, uh, and I've been working on this for 23 years, first IPCC and the first National Climate Assessment, many years, and I see more of an effort as more of an emphasis in the Department of Interior. Now all of the bureaus have to have a climate adaptation strategy. The cabinet level has this climate adaptation emphasis. And so, and we're, we just reveal or uh, let uh, posted this uh, GCIS, this Global Change Information System, through the U.S. Global Change Research Program. So it is tools that DOT develops, for example, need to be shared with the folks in the Navy doing the similar work, so we don't reinvent the wheel. And that the science, you know, from a science perspective, that that we can provide you if, if you ask a certain question, that we can give you an answer in practical terms that you can use. So yes, there is this huge national, federal climate adaptation strategy that's being implemented, you know, as we speak, and they meet monthly in the Department of Interior. Oh, you can hold on to that. Okay. Any any other questions or comments? To Michael. Uh, John Michael Cross with EESI, and I had a question about uh, the timelines of the projects in Hamden Roads and then also in Mobile. Uh, what's the, uh, what is the timeline to both get information out and then in, in Hamden Roads uh, to actually uh, make some changes to uh, the bases? Thank you. So I'm lucky and fortunate to be joined by the guy who knows more about this than anybody and um, gave me all the information I talked to, Commander John Marburger. He's our, our climate affairs officer uh, on the Navy staff, and he's been the, the key point of contact for the Hampton Roads pilot. Hi, yeah, so uh, the Hampton Roads area uh, pilot project is gonna be a two-year project. The first year is gonna probably be a process of coalescing everybody, all the partners down there. And then, so at the end of two years, short answer to your question, two years, <laughs> is about when we should have something focusing in on methodologies, on how we plan to bring everybody together and then get sea level rise forecasts uh, and everything to actually begin to start adapting to climate change. He's the brains behind the operation. <laughs> uh, for the project in Mobile, the first half of the project is already done, and so the results are already posted. So if people are interested in learning how we focused on criticality and how we um, did, worked on the climate information, that's available now. The assessment of vulnerability should be done, and po it's already done, but it should be posted on our website um, this summer. And then the rollout to finalize the study and kind of spread the information about the results would happen later in the summer. And then our pilot projects, the 19 ongoing pilot studies, those should be wrapping up at the end of the year and results would go online early next year. Uh, Rob, I also wanted to ask you in terms of thinking about um, sort of all of the different kinds of transport in the Gulf region because you've got everything in terms of all of the, the, the freight in terms of barge traffic, all of the pipelines, as well as highways, um, uh, you know, airports, you, you know, that there is so much, it, railroads uh, also critical in terms of movement of freight that supports everything. And talk a little bit about how that is being looked at in an integrated way. Yeah. Um, so part of why we picked Mobile, so for the second, this is phase two of the Gulf Coast study, we wanted to find the right place within the region um, to, to do this study. And part of that is having willing partners who are interested in the topic, and we found that in Mobile and a few other places. Um, but Mobile has had the right um, combination of not being too large. Some places are just too large and would have been too difficult to do the study. But Mobile has a good cross-section of all the different kinds of transportation modes we were most interested in. So in addition to highways and transit, um, the ports are very important. There's barge traffic that's very important. 
Um, there's pipelines that run through the region, both above ground and below ground. There's a lot of, um, I think, some class one rail facilities that run through Mobile. So that's part of why we picked that area. In doing the study, we, we had better luck with some modes than others. The private sector modes, some of them were less willing to share information. So we did have some, some issues with that. But in the end, we were able to get some good information from, for the ports and the railroads, partly tied to how things were done, um, tied to some of the publicly owned uh, infrastructure in, in, the, in the Port of Mobile. Um, but we purposely chose Mobile partly because it has such a big um, cross-section of the, these different kinds of infrastructure. So good question. Great. Uh, and Mr. Nasahar, I wanted to ask you, um, as you talked about how important it was that the Navy couldn't address these issues alone in terms of thinking about your, fa your, your facilities, your bases, and because it is so dependent upon what the community can really support and in terms of really working together on that. So I was just curious in terms of where you are, where the department is, uh, in terms of those conversations with communities, the receptivity, is this, uh, is this going forward in a pretty broad way in a lot of places where you do have facilities or, or what's happening? Right. So, so like I said, we, we really are in the infancy on our side because we're, we're really at the end of the process. Uh, it's all, it's just like your home. Uh, it, whatever it's zoned for, uh, that's what we build to. So there's there's lots of planning documents that you have to follow. You know the floodplain map. Mm -hmm. uh, and to those change, n nobody is going to change their design criteria uh, in the communities. You know insurance companies are based on those FEMA flood maps. Uh, you know the all the planning documents, whether it's the Navy, whether it's a commercial, whether it's your private home. It's all based on all these fundamental pla planning documents that other agencies are responsible for. Uh, so, you know, how much water is available? Is there sewage? What, what are the broken? <laughs> all those things have to be considered right. when you plan. But in, if those don't change, it's tough for not, not only the Navy but, but the whole community to, to change because no one is going to finance you. Nobody's going to give you insurance. Uh, so it's a very, very complex decision uh, because nobody can fund this themselves uh, in cash. Uh, right. it's, it, there's so many, how, how the taxes are collected. Uh, and so people ask, well, how come you guys aren't changing? Because we don't have a basis to change our design. Uh, because there's, like I said, all these fundamental documents and planning criteria so if you ever try to build a house or mm -hmm. renovate your house, you would understand going to, to try to get a building permit, they would ask you, did you do this and this and this? And if you didn't meet all these codes, you're not going to be able to do it. Uh, or you're not going to be able to get financing. Uh, you know, if, you, if you can pay for it yourself and, and live off of the grid, essentially, uh, you don't have to meet all those criteria. But we don't control those, all those criteria. And that's why it's tough for us in the Navy, let alone DOD, to say, well, how come you guys aren't moving forward? Well, because, and I kind of joke with his boss that, well, you have to tell me and get everyone to agree that the title change in Mayport or Jacksonville uh, is going to rise X amount over this period of time. And then we can work to get all those plants planning guys to say, look, that's what we have to design to. That's what the shoreline is going to look like. What are we going to need to do? Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I can't ask our, our people that write our design criteria and code to say, pick that number. Uh, because one, Congress won't fund us because uh, they're going to ask us, what, what did you base that off? And I wanted to ask, I'm okay, do you want to add anything to that? or? Um, no, well, I, I just have to um, concur with Mr. Nasuhar on that. Is, is if we're, you know, it, we are dependent on a lot of different information and a lot of different pe people and participants. So it's, it's it ten, this climate change stuff can be like herding cats at times, um, and and we need, but we have to act. So we, 
we, we, we desire total uncertainty, we, we desire total uncertainty, but we are going to have to act in the face of uncertainty regardless. And, um, but, but, so it's getting the people who write these f foundational documents and codes uh, is, is not an easy thing. So it's, um, yeah, that's just a challenge we're facing. So again, it is not a whole of government and whole of community uh, approach is necessary. And unfortunately, we had thought that we were going to have the mayor of Norfolk here with us today, and then he was not able to participate because I think you're, in terms of what you were saying about bringing those other voices in is a critical piece of, of helping work these solutions um, and to help move, move action forward. Um, any last comments? Or questions? Okay, then I please join me in thanking our wonderful panel. Thank you so much. For